my name is Pilar Mensa. I am the Assistant Dean of Admissions at the University of Houston Law Center. And the session we're bringing you today is regarding our um, part-time evening program. So we want to share some information with you about what you can expect if you were to join our part-time program. And we also have several panelists you'll be able to hear from um, current students and alumni, as well as a professor for the part-time program. So you'll get to hear different perspectives, um, you know, just depending on, on where they're situated. I did just wanna give a general overview of the part-time program, and then I'll let my panelists um, introduce themselves. So when thinking about the part-time or the full-time, um, the biggest difference is going to be when the classes are held. So for the full-time program, classes are usually Monday through Friday from about 9 p.m. to 3 p.m. For the part-time evening program, classes are Monday through Thursday, typically 6 to approximately 9 p.m. Other major difference is that if you're in the part-time evening program, there is no limitation on the number of hours you can work. So it does allow for you to work a full-time job during the day and then take your classes in the evening. Typically, if someone stays in the part-time program, it will be four years to complete. Um, both part-time and full-time start in August. So we just have one fall start um, that starts at the end of August. And um, we do have the same professors for both programs. So professors will go through different rotations and switch as to who teaches during the day and who teaches in the evening. But my point by saying that is you are getting the same caliber of education um, by attending the part-time program. I also want to stress some of the flexibility. So we ask that whatever program you start with, you complete your first year. So if you start with a part-time evening program, we'll ask that you finish your entire first year part-time, which is the fall, spring, and um, summer classes. After that, you can petition to switch programs. So if after the first year you decided you wanted to switch to full-time, you do have that option and it goes both directions. Um, and you'll hear from some of the panelists today that was their experience as well. They did start part-time and later on move to the full-time program. Um, that's just kind of my general overview on it. And I will go ahead and allow my panelists to introduce themselves. Professor Hoffman, I'll start with you. You just sure. want to say hello? Sure, I will do. Happy to do that. Um, just before I do, if it's possible to have your cameras on, it, it obviously, it should be obvious that it is more engaging both for us and it turns out for you to do that. So I would encourage you. I get that sometimes you're in a situation that you can't do that because you're, you know, for, for any number of reasons that has happened to me. But if it's possible to, I think you will get more out of this and I certainly will too. Um, okay, uh, I'm Lonnie Hoffman. I teach civil procedure. So if in the first year course, so if you were to start in the part-time program, I would be your professor for procedure uh, this fall. Uh, my two colleagues who are teaching in, as well in the part-time program are not here, but I can just briefly mention them. Uh, one of them is the incomparable Lauren Simpson, who would be teaching um, uh, your legal writing course. It's called Le Legal Skills and Strategies. Um, when I say incomparable, I'm not sure I've ever met a more generous and remarkable teacher than Lauren Simpson. Uh, and I'll let BB and or Kyra weigh in on that if they, I don't know if they shared my view, but I certainly think that. Uh, and then your third professor would be Gina Warren. Um, interestingly, and kind of relevant to what Pilar was saying, and I'll make it, I'll stop talking after this, but just quickly, just kind of in reference to what Pilar just said. So Lauren Simpson has been teaching the part-time program for a very long time. She, she is the, the, the scheduled teacher. Uh, so she knows how to teach to part-time students, legal skills, legal research and writing topics. Uh, I myself have taught now four years in a row because I decided to make a commitment to the part-time program to keep working on improving how I communicate. There are certain challenges that come with teaching part-time students. Again, Bibi and Cairo, but especially Bibi can probably talk to that because she was also a teaching assistant for me the following year. Um, uh, Gina Warren is more of the typical rotation that Pilar was talking about where my colleagues will rotate in and out of the full-time and part-time program. And that normally has how I've done it. It's just for the last four years, I've decided to double down on part-time, which is why I'm doing it again. So that's me. Thank you. Phoebe, would you like to go next? Sure, no problem. And I echo that all the teachers in the part-time program are exceptional. Um, and they teach from the perspective of understanding that uniquely that you are part-time and you're probably working and juggling all kinds of commitments. So I am 
uh, former part-time student. I'm a 2L, um, soon to be a rising 3L, cannot wait. Um, and I'm an older student. Um, so I'm in my 40s. Uh, I spent about 20 years in industry before deciding to finally come to law school. It's something I considered in my 20s, but you know, if you're on the fence and thinking, well, you know, is this the right switch? I will have to tell you that it was absolutely the right switch for me. Um, I, you might be questioning, you know, are firms interested in, you know, people who've already been in industry and, you know, are my job perspectives the same? If anything, the firms that I interviewed with really liked the fact that I had real world work experience, used to timelines, deadlines, reporting up. So if you have those questions, it's a huge asset to you um, coming from a work environment, work experience where you're crunch for time, crunch for deadline, crunch for resources um, and still get the job done. So just want to throw that out there. I did have an opportunity to TA for Professor Hoffman. And the great thing about that is not only is it a wonderful way to bar review, because when you're teaching someone something you've learned, it just sinks in more. But the other thing is you actually get course credit for that. So um, that's open to part-time students as well as full-time students as well. So that's me and I'll turn it over to Cairo. Thank you. Hi, how y'all doing? Um, I'm Cairo, I'm also a 2L, uh, gonna be rising 3L. I actually came in with BB, we were in the same class, so I did take Professor Hoffman for Civ Pro um, as well. Um, I can echo everything that they both were saying, um, but I wanna add that when it comes to employment, I definitely agree with BB how employers definitely appreciate the fact that you do have um, prior work history. I'm in my 30s and this, this will be my second career. I came from the military, so uh, a little different from BB as she's going to likely go into private practice. I'm going to stay in the public center, public se public sector, excuse me, uh, in government interest work. And I do, do find that all the internships that I've had this far, I've had three, each of them have appreciated the fact that I did work prior to. And I think that the part-time class is actually more engaging when you do other students that have real, real world experience. They have life experience. They're not just, you know, coming in from, from college and um, may not have had, may not have had the most experience as other people that might, uh, might be older. So it will be interesting as well with the part-time program. Thank you. And Chance, Chance is an alumni of the part-time program. Yeah, so uh, I started in the part-time program. I uh, worked all the way through. I worked as a mechanical engineer at a chemical plant on the south side of town during my whole time there. And I, I will echo Cairo's sentiment that I do believe that the part-time program was significantly more engaging uh, just from a diversity of perspectives of people in different phases in their life and their career. Uh, that's just not something that you're going to get in a lot of full-time classes because the vast majority of people are coming straight out of college. Um, yeah, so I, I work as a private attorney in the private sector right now uh, for a big law firm in intellectual property. Okay, thank you, Chance. And to our participants, I do have questions prepared um, just to keep the conversation going. But if you have questions for anyone on the panel, please please feel free to um, ask your question in the chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand, um, you can verbally ask your question um, through the audio. Uh, but I'll go ahead and get started with my first prepared question. So this is for our current students. What made you decide to attend law school part-time and at the University of Houston? Uh, I guess I'll go first, BB. You said, uh, what, um, what did I, how did I attend uh, law school part-time right. at U of English? Um, right, why, why did you decide part-time and then why at University of Houston? Because I had, I tended uh, to go part-time because I had a full-time job. I have a wife and kids, so I have responsibilities, so I got bills to pay, but I didn't want that to interfere with my passion and desire to go to law school. And U of H, um, seemed to meet those needs. I 
they had everything structured when I came to visit. They seemed very well prepared for me as rights to other schools that I went to. So it, it kind of worked well with me. Can I ask you to expand on that a little bit? You mentioned having a wife and family. So I'm going to jump on that part and just ask, how do you balance uh, work, wife, children, your responsibilities as a father, husband, employee, student? That's a lot. If you ask my wife, she would say I don't balance it, <laughs> but <laughs> I do feel like um, it takes a lot of discipline and time management and prioritization. Um, I do feel like sometimes, just like with anything, you can't get overwhelmed, but you just have to take a step back and realize what you're doing and refocus. Um, but it is, I'm not gonna lie to any of you, it is challenging, but it's not impossible. And I think that's the thing that you just need to keep remembering and tell yourself. Thank you. Phoebe, did you have anything to add? Sure. So um, my experience just, I worked in um, global clinical trials before law school and managing oncology studies and immunology studies. And it's a heavily regulated industry. So I had a lot of interaction with our legal. You have to understand FDA law, international law, HIPAA compliance. Um, and so for me, University of Houston is, you know, top in health law. We're top 10. Our health law and policy institute is top five. Um, and so I was really interested in the University of Houston. Um, and one thing I would recommend doing is I took a few student graduates out to lunch and just talked to them about their experience, um, both in the full-time and in the part-time program, because I wasn't sure I, whether or not I wanted to step away from work and do full time, I've been out of school for a while um, and ultimately settled on part time based on um, just the, the feedback uh, that I heard from the part time students that I sat down and just had lunch or coffee with. So that's something else if you're, you know, still deciding which school that you want to go to. Um, there's a couple part time schools, but really, you know, do things like this, but also, you know, students are always or graduates very happy to um, you know, go to lunch, go to coffee, talk to you a little bit more about their experience and their tips. And I have to say some of the tips that I gained from just talking to students one-on-one -on -one helped me in my first semester. And I'm so glad I, I knew what to expect. Thank you. Professor Hoffman, I'm gonna to move to you next. If you could talk a little bit about what would you consider some of the advantages of attending part-time? as well as maybe some of the challenges that you've seen with students face? Sure, uh, let me, I, I'm happy to do that, Pilar, and I, I agree those questions really go well together. Um, let me just quickly say to Trent, to your question, um, no. uh, uh, yes, all courses are released in advance, but bear in mind that in your first year, all your courses are preset, so you're not making any choices. The, the only place that that becomes relevant is uh, when you're in your, you know, mm -hmm. after the first year, so just, but, but yeah, those all get posted plenty of advance and then people register for those classes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because that's what I figured. Good point. Thank you. The year, depending yeah. on the year that you're in, you'll only be able to offer a certain amount of classes. But okay. Thank you. Yeah. And let me just, I'll just say one other thing about that, which, which has nothing to do with the part-time program in particular, but um, uh, for better or for worse, huh? <laughs> and you could look at it depending on how you look at it. We offer a lot of classes. Um, the reasons for that are, are very simple, um, but they're, they're really important, which are number one, uh, because we are a school that offers LLM degrees. So just as a, just, I don't know if anyone, everyone knows this. So all of you all will be starting law school to, get, to earn your JD, right? Your Juris Doctorate. But after you've gotten your JD, it is possible for students to go back to school and earn what's referred to as a graduate degree, the name of which we offer is called an LLM. Um, and we offer them in a whole bunch of specialties. So for example, like intellectual property is an LLM of ours and health law is an LLM of ours and, and tax is an LLM. Just, uh, those are just three big ones to name as an example. Well, obviously if you're offering all these LLMs, you have to have specialty classes, right? Cause like when you're a JD student and you take tax you're taking like intro type courses, right? I mean, maybe you'll do a little more specialized but you're not gonna go that far far in the weeds. But if you're going to go get an LLM in tax, we're going to need to offer another 10 or 15 classes in advanced tax. Well, all JD students can take those classes. So that is a, a feature of U of H that is actually not generally true of other schools. 
Um, some schools have LLMs like we do, some don't have as many, but we have a bunch. So I'm really not trying to like tout UT, U of H's horn. I'm just trying to say that is a reason we have a lot of classes. The other reason, and the reason we're able to staff those classes is because we're in Houston. Okay. We have this huge, you know, pool of qualified lawyers and judges to draw from. And if you look at our schedule, which I'm happy, if we have time, I'm happy to play with it, you on, a, on the screen share, you'll see that like there are a whole bunch of specialty classes taught by adjuncts. Those are lawyers and judges out in the community. So that's what makes us, why we have so many classes in our schedule to pick from. And like I say, it's a good and bad thing. Yeah, Trent, yeah. I guess I was more asking from uh, a perspective of location. So do you have, cause she said, Monday through Thursday, six to nine. So do you offer classes like at different locations, like Sugarland location? No, 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 no. That's a great question. No, all classes are offered on the main campus. So the one, the the one, yeah, the one that's just, yeah, yeah. There, there's the, the law school is only, on, not, not even downtown. We are only on the main campus. And of course we're about to have a brand new building. Um, uh, uh, but yeah. Um, but yeah, but we're only there. I mean, obviously you could have an online class, but but right. other than that, you're you're coming to the law school. That's right. Okay. All right. But yeah, that's what yeah, I'm doing. sorry. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Yeah. No, no. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. All yeah. right. So Pilar, sorry, we took a little detour. Oh, Bibi, did you want to jump in on yeah, that? Yeah, Bibi had her hand up. So I don't know yeah. to speak on it. Professor Hoffman, I think you said something really good. And I just wanted to jump in on it because Cairo and I were in the class together. So it is because we are in Houston, like the not only are your well, regular professors, amazing, but Kai and I had an opportunity to take a um, practical experience course with two litigators who are very well-known plaintiff's attorneys. And when you talk about a subject like civil procedure, Professor Hoffman gives you a lot of opportunity to practice and get it right, and it's a lot of writing. But then you go into a mock courtroom classroom and you get to actually practice what you've learned and I would say like, excellent, like both our full-time faculty, the adjunct professors, like there's just a wealth of knowledge there. And I just wanted to highlight what Professor Hoffman said, because I, I think that's such an advantage that we have. Thank, thanks, baby. And, and I want to be clear. I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, obviously I'm a big fan of U of H because I'm here, but, but, um, but um, you know, some of those advantages also exist for other schools too. Like, like, you know, I mean, you know, take South Texas, for example, they're also in Houston. So they get the same advantage that we get of having lawyers and judges. So I, I don't want you to think that I'm just like being a, yeah, I'm just describing why U of H has a lot of classes. And I agree with that, BB, that a great, great many of our professors adjunct and full-time are quite committed and quite, quite good. Um, so, but anyway. Uh, all right. Sorry, Pilar. It took a while to get back to your That's question. That's okay. So, this is all great. This is like I said, casual conversation. <laughs> um, so, and, and I'll, I'll uh, and also Michael, I know you had asked a question, but that's really not for me. So I'm going to go ahead and answer Pilar's and then we'll circle back to yours. But thank you. Thank you for getting it out there. Um, okay. So Pilar asked me basically two sides of the same question. She said, what's great about the part-time program and what are the challenges or what should you worry about? So the grade is easy. We've actually already talked about it, so I won't spend a whole lot of time there. Uh, it is that you have the flexibility to potentially work. And two, as Chance and Cairo and Bibi all have said, you have the great advantage that you're going to school with classmates who have had interesting life experiences, which is, I'm not trying to beat up on the part-time program, but they do tend to be younger and a lot of them have gone straight from college. And, you know, there are other advantages to having that cohort of people. But I must say, you know, when I said a few minutes ago to you all that I have made this commitment to the part-time program, I didn't mean that to sound entirely altruistic. I mean, one of the advantages that I personally, just as a, as a person that I get out of teaching the part-time students, is that uh, they're kind of cool, they're kind of interesting. Uh, and, you know, I mean, just, I won't mention people on the call just not to embarrass them, but, you know, last semester, uh, the guy who was, I was sure going to be the number one in my class, turned out he was number two, uh, was a full-time practicing doctor. He was as talented uh, a, a, of a person I've had in a long, long time, uh, uh, I mean, he was really something else and he worked full time. What an interesting background he had. Uh, and the guy who was the strongest student in the class, as it turned out, based on grades, um, worked full time at a law firm, worked for his aunt's law firm 
uh, and really put in a lot of time. And we had students all over the map. I've had cancer researchers. I've had you know people work in in, in all sorts of industry. And so yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty cool group of things. Okay, now the challenge. The number one challenge is that you work too hard. I mean, I'm delighted to hear that Cairo feels like he was able to manage it. I'm delighted that I can tell you that BB managed it because I've now known her pretty well for two years. Um, Chance, you can talk about your experience, but I am telling you unequivocally that if you try to work full time in law school, and this is not about U of H, and I'm sorry if Pilar and, <laughs> and Marisha don't want me to say this, but I'm just telling you, it will be hard. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. Cairo is absolutely right about that. And again, the star student, I was convinced, and indeed he turned out to be the number two in the class, not the number one, worked undoubtedly 60 hours a week. I mean, a, a mind-boggling schedule, not counting his, his, his time as a, as a law student. I mean, those are inconceivably hard numbers to, to carry. Oh, and he had a family. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very hard to work full-time and to get out of law school what you need. I, I just am telling you that is a challenge. Um, the problem is there's no easy answer to that challenge. If you have to work, if, if money is so, is so critical that you can't go to law school without doing it, then okay. Do what the number one student in my class last year did. I'm not making up this story. At some point he says to me, after he found out that he was the number one student in the class at the end of the semester, he says to me, just Jamie maybe says to me, um, you know, I made a commitment in the middle of the semester when I saw how incredibly hard it was going to be for me to work full time and, and be a law student, that I was just gonna do the best I can. I couldn't leave my job. I needed the money and I had committed to my aunt. And so I had to do that. But I just decided I was gonna do the best I could. And if that meant I ended up being a B or a B minus student or whatever, that was the choice I made. But that, but that was a choice I made consciously. So it turns out he ended up being the number one student. So he's a unique and remarkable individual, but that's the attitude you ought to have is what I'm trying to say. If you have that attitude, great. You don't have to be number one to have a successful career. Absolutely not. Just be aware that you're gonna be injured. Okay, I've babbled on too long. I'm gonna let others jump in on that, but, but I do think that's a critical point for me to share. So I wanted to talk about that. Thank you. Cairo, did you have something to add? Yes, I just want to double down on what Professor Hoffman said. Um, I am of the mindset that you have to sometimes do things that are challenging and you just got to deal with it. Right? So that's how I tackled law school. I knew it was going to be hard. It was hard, especially working full time at the time. Um, but, you know, you, when you have no choice because you have responsibilities to take care of, you have no choice and you just keep that in the back of your head. But I'm also of the mindset that I don't really care about my grades. Not that I want to fail. And I, I have never failed a class or got less than a B in a class. But I'm also, as long as you try your hardest, then you can't really be upset with yourself. And um, even me getting um, Bs in classes, it's never hindered me from doing anything that I've wanted to do. I've had multiple internships on the federal side, um, in government, on the state side. I've also um, now in uh, on the mock trial team, which is also very competitive. So don't think that because there is this challenge and because your grades may take a take a hit because of the time that you don't have to give to it. Also, don't think that that's going to hinder your progression from being able to do anything that you want to while at the school. Thank you. Phoebe, you had your hand up next. Yes, because Kai's being humble. Uh, Kai was at <laughs> the U.S. District Attorney's Office, and Kai is part of my inner circle and study group. So, um, and he works incredibly hard. And you know, when you're older, sometimes you're like, "Oh my goodness, this is a lot of information. How am I going to memorize it? How am I going to do this or that?" If you're having those thoughts, it's normal. It's natural. We all do, but that should not stop you from uh, going to law school because you are 
you will be surprised how much you can retain. And then just going back to what Professor Hoffman was saying about his number one student. So he, Jamie was in my TA group and I want you to know it, it did not, I mean, yes, he is brilliant, but he also worked very hard. When you are in a class and you have the benefit of having TAs, go to TA office hours. If your professor says, I am available, I have office hours, which Professor Hoffman is pretty much always makes himself available, go to his office hours. If your TA isn't helping you or doesn't know, go to your professor's office hours. I mean, that's what students like Jamie do. So, and not only that, he was brilliant. He worked incredibly hard, but he was also very humble and was the first person to help someone else. So, you know, being an older student and kind of having those life experiences and perspectives where you realize like your accomplishments don't make you who you are um, and you know how to work more collaboratively, you know, I, I think that's like one of the biggest assets. So that's all I wanted to add there. And I totally agree. And I think that's a theme you'll see as you're looking at any law school or you're looking at full time or part time the effort that you put into it is, is going to be what's key in terms of your success and how you do in classes and your grades is that that work ethic and having and knowing coming in that it's going to be a lot of hard work. I think knowing that and accepting that before you start will also really increase your chances of success. Chance, you had your hand up next. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight two things that Professor Hoffman said and answer one question in the chat. Uh, Yes, there Professor was a Hoffman, question directly for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, Professor Hoffman was very nice, but I do think he understated one thing massively. Uh, the part-time program is not kind of cool, people-wise. We are very cool. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people in there that will have backgrounds, work experience that you just won't be able to be around and have that kind of contact and one-on-one -on -one with so many different people from so many different industry sectors. It, it is a group of people that you're just, we are very cool. I just want to make sure that that is said and known. Uh, the second understatement, it, it is not hard. It is very hard, okay? Uh, working full-time, having responsibilities outside of law school, which is in itself very difficult is a grind. Uh, and I, I think everyone has said it, but I just want to repeat it. If you know that going in, it is helpful, but however hard you think it is, you are underestimating how difficult it actually is. So just know that going into it. Uh, so my question was from Avery. Uh, the IP program at U of H, what made it different. Uh, I didn't even realize how different U of H's IP program was until I got to my first internship. Uh, I was talking with the, my mentor partner and it's like, oh, you know, how many classes, you know, how many, you know, IP classes have you taken? I started listing out, you know, patent prosecution, uh, patent litigation, like four or five other patent classes that I've now forgotten the names of at least. And his eyes were just about, you know, the size of half dollars. And like, well, what, what are you talking about? Like, when, at his law school, his IP program consisted of patent law, copyright law, and trademark law. And that was all of their IP classes. Uh, whereas at U of H, there were, good God, probably three or four trademark classes, three or four copyright classes. And I would say probably upwards of 10 patent specific courses. Uh, so you can really dig into IP from multiple different perspectives and show up at a job with multiple different um, areas that you're comfortable with. Uh, you know, you're not going to walk out of law school and be, you know, quote unquote, practice ready because, you know, law school doesn't necessarily teach the current law all the time. And you know, it is the current law. It may not be the law of the case that you're handling. The facts may be different, you know, any number of things. But if you're comfortable in an area, it makes that whole run up process so much faster, so much easier. Uh, and so I think that made a big difference for me personally. Does that answer your question, Avery? 
Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> So picking up what Chan said, and just Dan, I know you get your hand up for a question. Let me just take two seconds and just share a screen so you can see. Ch Chance is basically just picking, doing the exact same thing I was saying about how one of the reasons that we have so many classes, I was, I was talking about our LLM programs and our pool of adjuncts. So let me just quickly share my screen for just one second. Hopefully everybody, yes, so give me a thumbs up if y'all can see my screen. Thank, Thank you. you. So I am drawing from, just to, so you can see where I am. Here, let me even go backwards just to show you here. So if you're on the home landing page of U of H here, whoops, sorry. Click on students, scroll down just a little bit to course schedule. So you can do this yourselves, course schedules. And then I'm just gonna pick the current semester, but I absolutely promise you, this is exactly the same every single semester, like in the general focus of what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna click on spring 2022. And then you'll see that you can click on this drop down and let's say, let's talk about intellectual property since Chance was just talking about that. So these are all intellectual property and information law related classes that are offered just this one semester. So copyright law, kind of an introductory class. Intellectual property survey, introductory class. By contrast, almost every other class that's on this schedule are advanced courses in intellectual property law that are pretty specific. I mean, you can see that list for yourself. That's in one semester. If you do the fall, there'll be another 10 to 15 classes. And this is just IP. You do the same thing for tax, same thing for energy, same thing for health law. And again, the reason we have so many classes, let me stop sharing my screen, is for those reasons I said before. Now, again, we are not utterly unique in that regard. If you go to school in another big city that also has a school that has an LLM program, you might get the same experience, but you definitely get it at UH. So anyway, just to reiterate and sort of give you a visual of what Chance was talking about. Dan, did you wanna go next? Yeah, I appreciate it. I actually have to drop for a work call. So I just wanted to say thanks for organizing this. It's very helpful. And for those like current and, and former students, if if you're open to just sharing your email address so that I can just, I'm like a sponge right now, trying to get as much information as I can given where I'm at in my career. Yep. So I would uh, welcome the opportunity to reach out and set up time if, if it makes sense. Why don't we email, Pilar, will you email everyone's our email addresses to everyone just so that we have it. And then I'll make the same offer that I've, I've talked to about half a dozen prospective students one-on-one -on -one right now. If anyone wants to do that with me, I'm happy to chat. And I, I will definitely give you an unadulterated view of, of both law school and of U of H. So great, that would be, that would be fantastic. Thanks so much. Yep. I'll send a follow-up email thanking you for attending and include yeah. Thanks, uh, their information. Also, this is being recorded, so it'll be on our website, um, or I can send the link as well, uh, so you can get the second half Good. of this Fantastic. Session. Thank you thank, all. And thank you, Dan. And then the next person, I'm not sure what your first name is, but B. Palomino. Hey, guys. Yeah, it's Brandon uh, Palomino. <clears throat> I just had a quick question. Thank you all for uh, doing this for us as well. Um, one uh, for chance, um, just I have a very similar background to yours, um, but uh, was curious about what your timing was when you took the patent bar exam. Was it like immediately after law school when you finished or during the course of or prior to starting your first semester? And then for the uh, uh, faculty and admissions people, I just had a quick question. Um, there are some law school uh, consultant companies that will review, you know, students' applications and some of them are charging, you know, between four and six thousand dollars if it's on the high end, which I really don't see the value in that. I just wanted to kind of get your way, Wayne, and thoughts for senior or other professionals. Like I think we're all, uh, you know, working professionals. I don't really know if that would be valuable. Um, just wanted to get your insight on that. And then also, like, um, for anyone that wants to uh, kind of fill in on, you know, after graduating law school, um, what what is what would be your take on doing a JD MBA or seeing the value of having the MBA um, along with your, your law degree? <clears throat> All right, so I'll jump in and take some of that first. Uh, so for me personally, I took the patent bar right before I graduated. Uh, and that was just really the semester I had the most time, to be honest. Uh, the patent bar isn't, really all of that related to patent law. Uh, it's a test over patent office procedure and how well you can read their manual. Uh, 
it is hard. It is, it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of memorization, but you could really take it at any point in time and be fine. Uh, I decided to wait and take it, you know, right before I graduated. It's when I had the most time. And quite honestly, any firm that hires you, you're not going to be signing anything with your registration number for probably a year or two, at least. So it's not even super critical that you have it before you start working. But I would definitely recommend getting it done before you start working because you will not have time to study for it. Uh, I can't remember uh, what your other question was. Well, I think the next one was about the professional services that are available. Is that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, like some of these consultant services to review your applications, personal statements, I mean, you know, they're charging a good amount of money. And I don't, uh, and thank you, Chance, for the answer to that. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I really don't particularly see the value in it, um, but I don't know if you you guys would recommend that for you know someone who's a career changer looking to apply to law school or how y'all would approach that for uh, fellow students part time law. No, you know I've never recommended any sort of professional services uh, for for uh, prospective students or applicants to the program. I think there's so many resources out there that are available to you to assist you with the application process. I mean, our admissions office, you know, is a great start. We can give you general tips and advice. Um, we can't like read your personal statement and give you feedback on it because that would be a conflict of interest. But I'm sure there are people in your life that you do feel could give you constructive criticism when looking through your application. And we do encourage you um, to, to reach out to people that you trust and have them read your personal statement, have them give you feedback and help you um, polish it, whether it's grammatically or maybe forgot something that you they think is worthy of you mentioning in your personal statement, definitely letting other people proofread it. Um, that's probably the biggest component where you may get feedback from others, uh, possibly your resume as well. Um, you know, your transcripts, undergraduate degree, all of that, it's already done. Um, taking the LSAT, that's really on, on, on your own. Um, and that's where I might say, it could be worthwhile looking into having a professional, you know, um, testing service help you study for the exam. But that again is on a case by case basis. Um, there are a lot of free resources. The Law School Admission Council offers um, resources for studying for the LSAT. So that's not even a must, but that would be the only area I would say for someone to possibly think about paying for um, a third party, you know, testing prep service to help them, um, especially if you know, where their, their baseline in terms of their LSAT score or their GRE score is much lower than their goal and what they want to reach. And when they're looking at schools, what those median numbers are for those schools, if there's a big gap in that they're trying to overcome, then a professional service might be helpful. Um, but I think it's not necessary um, for the application process itself. And it is, like you said, it's very expensive. <laughs> so um, I would say utilize the resources you have. Um, and the, the people that you turn to for assistance with application could potentially also be the same people you will be asking for letters of recommendation. Um, those people are going to know you well and going to be able to speak to your experience, your work ethic and things like that. So um, typically when advising students about letters of recommendation, I encourage them to include their resume, their personal statement, their transcripts to those recommenders um, so that they're able to write a very specific letter about you. It's not just a generic general letter, you know, that looks like it could have come from anyone, um, but they have a bigger picture and it makes it easier for them to write it, right? So anytime I'm asked to write a letter of recommendation, I'm like, okay, what I need, like, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? Let me see your resume, all of those sorts of things. So they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and then I don't know if anyone on the panel has done a JD MBA or done any of the dual degrees. Um, just generally speaking, I can say, um, I think MBA is our most popular dual degree program. And in terms of the application process, they are separate. So whatever requirements MBA would have, um, you would need to fulfill those, but we do have, that is one of the dual degrees that we offer. Um, and typically students are able to complete both um, with maybe just one additional semester or one additional year um, added onto the law degree. But in terms of being practice ready and being able to become licensed, obviously that's not necessary. Um, it's not necessary to get an MBA and the JD is all that you need to practice. So I think it just depends on what your career goals are and what you're looking to do um, with it after graduation, if it's worth that additional year of study. Uh, Carol, you just to add, yes, just to add um, as far as 
the question that you asked about the services, someone mm -hmm. do your application. I have the same anxiety that I'm assuming you have with trying to make sure that my application was the best it could be. Um, I did see those services, but like you said, they're too costly. So I, I wouldn't recommend it at least as a student. My undergrad institution actually, through their registration or admissions office, they all they had the capability to review those mm -hmm. items for me. So I don't know if whatever school you graduated for um, has that option, but I would definitely call them and see if they can do that. I don't know if it was like career services or mm -hmm. graduation, the graduate admission services, but mm -hmm. someone was able to help me with that. that. That's a great point. And that's true. Most universities do have what they would consider a pre-law advisor. Um, and I know for U of H that does come out of our undergraduate career services office. They have uh, pre-law advisors to help students that are interested in going to law school. So that is another avenue you could look at your undergraduate institution, see if there are any resources there. And sometimes even professors uh, will be listed as pre-law advisors. So some of the professors maybe in the political science department. Um, hey, Pilar, there were two or three four questions that we we got on the chat that that um, right. as someone who teaches who has taught online now for two and a half years I know how hard it is to juggle the the chat and the the live so right <laughs> the conversation was going so well I didn't want to yeah. uh, no, interject great. with the chat Can but I, I will look at those questions now so Michael asked about applying um, with the June LSAT so the part-time program application deadline is May 15th so about a month from now. So if you're thinking out of, about applying for this cycle, I would suggest or highly recommend, encourage you to have your application in by May 15th. Even if you don't have an LSAT score yet, um, then you'll take the LSAT in June. So as soon as the scores are available, your application will be complete and we can review it. June is a little bit late, but we do accept it. Um, we kind of say on a space available basis at that point. Um, because most students, like I said, have already submitted their application with everything, but we will review every application we get. Um, and, you know, a strong application at the end is, is a strong application. So I still do encourage you to apply, um, even if you are looking at June. And just to keep in mind for the future, our application deadline remains the same every year. So next year, it'll be May 15th as well for the part-time program. Um, can I jump in? So Anna, you asked that question about the, the campus activities being missed, and, and I know we got some, a partial answer. Let me just add one other thing. That's really entirely up to you. Uh, and what I mean by that is, obviously, if you're working during the day, you can't easily go to a, uh, an event, you know, if it's during the day. Um, and so I know that that has been a source of some difficulty and frustration, but I don't think that's like a U of H issue. I think it's just, a you know, your schedule doesn't permit you to go. Um, we certainly welcome anyone to go. Uh, and we also try to put on events at, at the five o'clock hour, because that often is a transitional time. But again, it's tough, especially when you're driving to like get there. I do think we're having, you're seeing more and more events online, um, which makes it easier. I, for example, I'm putting on a program tomorrow and we've invited uh, all, all the students, including part-time students to join the programs at noon, but it's by Zoom. So you know, it may be that that's easier to join. And I think, I suspect that'll become more and more the norm. So uh, to add on that. And Sarah, I don't know if we fully answered your question on the TAs, but I would just say, generally speaking, there's a ton of flexibility. Um, I, I, I employ multiple TAs so there's always someone who will be available to talk to. Literally, I have four or five TAs literally every year. Um, and so other classes might only have one. So we have a little bit more challenge there. But, but generally speaking, people are aware when they're TAing or teaching a, a part-time students that we have to be flexible with timing and hours. And so I think that's, that, that's we're pretty respectful in that regard. Thank you. Of course. And that speaks a little bit to Trent's next question in terms of how do you support your students? What are the student services available for working adults? So um, Trent, so Trent goes, yeah, yeah, Trent and I can talk about this some more separately, you know, and, but, but just for everyone's benefit, if you want to know my number one frustration with, 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 uh, with students in general, <laughs> it's that you don't take advantage of all the resources that are here. I mean, Bibi was talking about it earlier. I mean, it's a joke that BB and I had is that BB could have regular scheduled office hours and no one would show up. You build it and they, nobody comes. Um, but so, so the, and the issue isn't that people are lazy. There's all kinds of psychological reasons 
why people don't go see their TA or see their professor. And all our job is to do is to try to gently encourage you to get over those psychological hurdles because none of them are good reasons. They just never are. Grading is anonymous at the end of the year. If you look like an idiot in the middle, A, you don't really look like an idiot. And B, um, that's the only way you're gonna get better even if you are asking a question that you, know, you need some redirection on. Um, but that's, that's where you're gonna get better. You're not gonna get better only studying as hard as you can on your own and coming to class every day. Yes, you have to do those things. Those are bare minimums. But if you really want to get better at law school, you've got to collaborate. You've got to collaborate with your classmates. You've got to collaborate with your TAs. You got to collaborate with the writing tutoring program. You've got to reach out to your professor. You got to reach out to your faculty mentor and your student mentors that we assign to you and make that an opportunity for you to connect with those people. I mean, the whole reason I created a TA program that I did years ago, where I employ four or five TAs in my course, is because I knew students were reluctant to talk to me. Even before I lost my hair, <laughs> I wasn't an old man. Uh, students were more hesitant to talk to me than they were to talk to my students, my former students. That's why I created the program, you know, and that's why lots of us have TAs. So you just get, so it's not a question of, do we have things to support you? We have a lot of things to support you. The question is, is how can we encourage you to support yourself? What, you know, take advantage of all those things. Anyway, this, this is a major, major issue. And uh, that, that what it, but there's a solution to it. That's the, that's the great, great thing. So uh, BB, before you go, uh, Kanisha had had her hand, Kanisha, am I pronouncing that right, Kanisha? Kanisha had her hand up. So let's, let's let her do that. And then we'll turn back to you for that. Oh, and it'll be very quick. You guys actually hit on some while my hand was up. Um, <laughs> so, Pilar, you already um, touched on just, you know, hey, a strong application is strong no matter where it arrives in the cycle. Um, and that answers part of it. Um, my concern, or I, I'll put it this way, uh, God forbid I actually have to use it. <laughs> in the event, um, I have a pending application with you guys. And in the event that I'm not chosen for this cycle, um, I'm one of those those candidates that I want U of H, so I'm just gonna come back and bother you next year. And my question for you is, um, I am the type where I wanna know what I can fix, so I have time to fix it before I apply again. How long would you suggest I wait to bother you all? And would it be possible to even bounce um, some areas of concern off of other parts of the staff that aren't in admissions, if I'm coming across clear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I will say, um, yes, so there are many applicants like you who are very interested in knowing what they can do to improve their application for a future cycle if they're not admitted on their initial. Um, and we do offer reapplicant counseling, and that's in August. It's usually a week long in August that we open up to anyone that would like to discuss their application. Um, we ask that you make an appointment because that gives us an opportunity to re-review your application before we meet with you to discuss it. Um, so if that were the case, I would, I would recommend that you do that. Um, and then we're happy to put you in touch with other um, members of the Law Center community, um, constantly reaching out to our career office to put them in touch um, with the prospective students, um, as well as professors. If someone has a really specific interest in an area of law, I will reach out to a faculty member and ask if they have time to speak with a prospective student. And I'm always given a yes. I can always find someone that's happy to speak with you and, and give you their opinions and advice and recommendations from their perspective. Thank you. And then, uh -huh, no problem. And then, BB, did you still want to say something? You took your hand out. Sorry, just before you before we switch to BB, uh, Gabby just asked, how do we sign up for that application? Oh. For you is it on the recruiting calendar? Um, it's on our website um, under Visit Us. There's different sections for different kinds of appointments that you can make, and you're going to be looking for the one that says Free Applicant Counseling. And if you can't find it, just email either. Yeah, I was going to say email our office if you can't find it or just, yeah, yeah and we'll, we'll set you up. Uh, skip me. We have another question. <laughs> Anna, did you want to go ahead? Yes. Sorry, I'm in my car. I'm just out for lunch. Um, but I wanted to ask more on that. Um, does the application have to be the year prior? Um, because I wanted to know, because I applied a few years back, um, but of course I wasn't ready. So I went out, did some work. Um, and I just want to know if that application has something that could be better. Of course, I have a lot more experience and I've got my LSAT score up, but I just want to know 
if there was something I could add to or fix on that one. Right. Absolutely. We can look back at applications that are older than a year. Our system goes back to 2002. So as long as it was 2002 or after, I'll be able to see it pretty easily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do I have time to offer a book recommendation? Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I have a, I'll put it in the chat, but let me just describe why, why I'm going to recommend it. Um, so there is one challenge that the vast majority of law students face. That's part-time, full-time, U of H, any, any law school in the country. Anybody want to guess what that challenge is? What do you think is so universal? But yeah, Kanisha? Imposter syndrome. Ah, awesome. Good, keep going. You're in the right space. Good, excellent. That is certainly <laughs> one illustration of it. What else? That's one manifestation of it. It's just anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem with well-being in the profession and we have a problem with mental health and well-being in law school. It's a big problem. It doesn't have to be a problem, but it, it is for a great, great many students. So I strongly recommend this book. I, I don't make any money on this book. This is just a book I love. Uh, it's called The Happy Lawyer by Levitt and Linder. And I've just sent, put it in the chat for everyone. You can buy that book on online for probably seven, eight, nine bucks. It is a fantastic investment. It is one you should read before you go to law school, wherever and however you go to law school. And it is certainly one you should reread during especially your first year, if not multiple times. There's lots of good advice in there. There are lots of other things to read, but what I love about recommending that particular book is that it, by trans, it, is that, uh, it, it encapsulates a lot of the very good advice all in one place. And I cannot, again, emphasize, there are so many things you can do to prepare for law school. You can take a prep course, you could watch those. Do we have, do, do students have, students have access to the 1L, the 0L stuff that, that Harvard does, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, right? Yeah. Yes. That's an excellent resource from the limited amount that I've seen it. It's called Zero L. It's a play off of Scott Turow's One L book. So Z-E-R-O hyphen L. Um, and, and I think, I'm pretty sure it's all free and you've got access to it. So there's all sorts of things you can do. And I'm not saying those things are bad or useless. I'm just saying they're not as important as figuring out how you can care for yourself so that you can succeed in law school under any circumstances. Resilience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. Tiffany. We have, hey, Tiffany has her hand up and we've got about five more minutes just to let everyone know. Thank you Go so ahead, much, Tiffany. I'll make it quick. I'm so happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Um, appreciate all the great contributions today. I had two questions. The first was just on y'all's online offerings. I believe Professor Hoffman stated y'all do have online courses. I was curious about how many of those you have and if there's a requirement for in-person courses versus online courses. And then also on the part-time program applicants, if there's a difference with how y'all measure applicants over the full-time program versus in regards to softs and the medians, because it's mentioned how diverse the applicants are and if that's valued a bit more for the part-time program versus somebody who's applying for your full-time program. So Tiffany, I'll let Pilar obviously answer the, the second question. Let me just quickly answer your first, because it's easy. We're exactly the same as 99.9% .9 of law schools in the country as to the online. And the reason for that is, is that we're governed by the American Bar Association's requirements. So there are just limits that all law schools have unless unless you get a special waiver. So for example, St. Mary's in San Antonio has a pilot project that it's in the middle of right now in which it can try to offer more online education. In fact, I think their goal is to try to make it so that a student can graduate 100% being online. That's currently only a pilot project that would make it a proof for a full-time um, thing, but it's like a five-year pilot. But other than a, an, a very special exception like that, all schools are subject to the same thing. So for the last few years, all schools have been able to offer more online because of the exception for COVID. Whether that continues remains to be seen, but once it ends, we'll all be subject again to the same requirements as to the normal rule. 
Does that do, do you find, so? So some schools do it a little differently than others. For example, I heard a story the other day about um, New York Law School. Apparently, what they do is they do ten weeks in person. I'm sorry. They, yeah, they do ten weeks in person. I, I don't know if I have this exactly right, but I believe they have ten weeks in person followed by they send everyone home and everything else is online for the last four or five weeks. Again, I don't know for sure that's right, but you could play with it in different ways. We're given a limited amount of time that we can offer is what's called distance education um, under the ABA standard. So anyway, we're not any different than anybody else in that regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. And then in terms of your application, so uh, we typically don't get as many uh, part-time applications as we do full-time. Um, and we're always looking to grow the part-time program. So um, I can't say that one program is any more competitive than the other, um, because obviously there's more full-time applications, but there's more full-time seats available. So I feel like it's kind of a wash, um, but we will look at your experience um, and you know your professional experience, what you've done between law school, I'm sorry, undergraduate and, and law school now that you're applying. Um, we also recognize that whatever grades you earned in undergrad, they may be very old at this point. Um, and so there's a maturing process that we know that goes on in between undergraduate and, and law school. Um, and so if that's, you know, a situation that you're facing, or if you feel like that, that speaks to you in terms of your cumulative GPA in undergrad, um, then, you know, you can focus more on making sure your LSAT or your GRE score is strong um, and that gives us an indication of you know more what you would be like as a student and let me just pause and mention that we do accept the GRE I've said that a couple of times and I don't know if anyone knows that or is aware of that but we are accepting the GRE now in addition to the LSAT so you do have an option in deciding which entrance exam you would like to take um, but please just plan to take one um, we can't accept both if you were to submit a GRE and an LSAT we would still have to look at the LSAT and report the LSAT to the American Bar Association and US News and all of those things. So uh, my recommendation, if you haven't already taken your entrance exam, possibly take a practice of the GRE, a practice of the LSAT, see which one you think you can improve the most on and, and, and stick with one and, and move forward with that. Um, so yes, we are looking more at your professional experience and we wouldn't necessarily someone who's coming straight from undergrad. Did that answer your question? Okay, great. Sarah, I think you have you have the floor for the last question. Okay, thank you all. Sorry, I'll try to make it quick. Um, speaking of GPA requirements for admissions, um, I had a good GPA, I just put that out there, but I was an electrical <laughs> engineering major. Um, so are your, is your undergraduate major taken into account? Um, because I know, like coming, I was an electrical engineer, so I know my GPA, while it was good for electrical engineering, compared to somebody in non-STEM, it might look a little weaker on an application. Right, absolutely. So we do look at um, what you majored in, knowing that some majors are more challenging than others. Engineering is always the example I give when I discuss this, um, or any of the hard sciences. Um, sometimes, you know, we'll see some with the medical background, um, and, and those majors just tend to be harder, and we know that, and we will take that into consideration, just like we take into consideration the age of the grades. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it's one o'clock, but I'll give our panelists, if anyone has any like last words of advice they'd like to give, that could be a great way to end this session. Good luck I'll, just end, I'll just end by saying, repeating and saying thanks everybody. And again, as a reminder, all of us are happy to talk again in Pilar um, or Marisha will send out our emails. You're welcome to keep the conversation going. Happy to keep chatting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll Good luck everyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're good. I heard good uh, luck. <laughs> uh, I mean, just leaving it with you. If you're a prospective student, don't worry too much about what can I prepare? What can I do this? What can I do that? Spend time with your loved ones, people you care about, because uh, there will be about three and a half, four years where you won't have as much time to do that. Uh, so soak up all that you can. Uh, Cairo, BB, just keep swinging. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. I know it looks small at this time, but it gets better. And I agree with that recommendation. Sometimes students ask, what should I do in the summer before I left start law school? And I'm like, relax, go on a vacation, enjoy do your a damn thing. <laughs> Develop because a you'll always feel that pressure to have to study once you start. 
It won't be the same even if you do take a break. Read the book I recommended and develop a meditation practice. There's all sorts of things you can do for taking care of yourself. And law school doesn't have to be a, you know, bite your teeth and grin and hope, you know, squeeze and hold on tight for three years or four years. And neither does your career in law. So it's, it's, you have to figure out how to work on these things in advance to make sure you have put yourself in the right position to succeed and that success actually feels like a win to you. You can do those things, but you have to be thoughtful about them. Great words of advice. I'm going to end on that note. Thank you all so much for joining.